Hallelujah. Please be seated. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Have your Bibles with you this morning? I trust you do. If you don't, you can look up on the screen. And I'm going to ask you to turn once again to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 1. Jeremiah and chapter 1. Now, we've been here before, and I've, I've been speaking and sharing on the subject of the fact that God has your name written in his heart before the foundations of the world. So here, Jeremiah, God reminds or speaks to the prophet Jeremiah, of which we, we had the opportunity of reading. But let's go back to it once again, because I need to get just, let's just go ahead and get a good start this morning so we can end in a profound manner as to what the Lord has to say to us this morning. You already prayed, you've worshiped, your heart's ready to receive. May the Lord bless his word as we read it. I'm reading from the fourth verse. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Remember, the word sanctified means to set apart. He said, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, this is Jeremiah speaking, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. And do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Now, I've, I've we've read this once, twice, and for the third time, I've, we've read it again, but here's the reason I ask you to turn to this passage, is because if God said this about Jeremiah, he is saying the same things about us. Well, he didn't necessarily call you as a prophet to the nations. However, he called you. The Bible says that you, haven't, you didn't choose him, he chose you. Now, I don't know whether you understand or you should understand that there's something in the Scriptures called divine election. Divine election. It means that divine election means that before the time God has predestined you. In other words, he knew you before you were even formed. And it means that he chose you before you were even born. He chose you. He said, you didn't choose me. That's what the Bible says. He said, I chose you. This is so important to know. He said, I'm the one who formed you in the womb. And I called you, I set you apart for this purpose. That you might be, this is, this is Jeremiah, that you might be a prophet to the nations. Well, you have to discover what did God choose you for. Why did he choose you? Why were you chosen? Well, there's a passage that I want you to turn to quickly. If you would, go with me. Let's go over, let's look at a good example here in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Now, I'm going to encourage you, if you did not get the message or you weren't here in our last teaching, I encourage you to get it so you can catch up where we are today. You know, it's important to hear the whole story. Sometimes you get part of a message and you didn't get the whole thing and you, don't, and, and, and you miss the real crux of the message or the importance of it. So I encourage you to get last week's and the week before. Now, now watch this. In the ninth chapter, beginning at the 11th verse, it says, For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, 
that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Did you get that? Now, somebody say, why did you read this? Because here's a story that I want you to, uh, let, let, let me rehearse it to you. Just look up here for a moment. All right? Now, no, no, again, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's read it one more time. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Not yet being born, but of him. This is in reference to Isaac and Jacob and Esau. Isaac was married to Rebekah. Rebekah was barren. Isaac sought the Lord to touch her womb. And the Bible says she conceived. But when she conceived, there was trouble going on on the inside of her. She was troubled, the Bible says. And she went to the Lord and inquired of the Lord, why, if this is you, why am I so troubled? And the Lord says to her, there's two nations in you. He said, there are two peoples that will come out of you. One will be great, and the other will not be. He says, these two nations will come out of you, and the younger or the older shall serve the younger. That was Jacob and Esau. And so this verse make reference to that. So if we keep reading in verse 12, it says, and it was said to her, this is Rebecca, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now the word hate doesn't mean hate as we know it. It means rejected or prefer less. He said, Jacob I love, and Esau I prefer less or I reject it. Then the next verse says, what shall we say then? Is it therefore unrighteous with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now what I want you to see is that he says, I love Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Before they were even born. That's called divine election. So someone will say, well, is it God unrighteous to make that decision? No, because God knows and he knows in advance who will follow forward his will. And he knew that Jacob, you remember the covenant with Abraham was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew in advance who would forward his will. And so when God chose Jacob, it's because he knew that Jacob would follow him and live for him and serve him. Esau sold his birthright for a meal. But Jacob got a hold of the birthright that belonged to his brother. Hello? Even though Jacob was a deceiver. <laughs> he was slick. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. But his heart was towards God. And God knew that in advance. And that's why he says, I love Jacob. Because he, he will follow my will. See, God doesn't look on the outside. He looks at the inside. He looks at the heart of men. And so he chose him before he was even born. God has chosen you is why you're here this morning, before you were even born. Before you were even shaped and formed in the womb, before you were even conceived, God chose you. God chose me. And he chose us because he has a plan for us. Now, we've read in Scripture where it says in, in, in the book of Psalms 139. How many remember what we've read? 
Now, in fact, I want you to turn there quickly. We'll read that one verse. Psalms 139. You're still with me, right? All right, Psalms 139. And in the Psalms 139 and verse 16, I want to read it once again to you, but I want to read it out of the NLT. So if you would, put Psalms 139, verse 16 in the NLT. Thank you. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to read, just leave it up there. I'm going to read beginning at verse 14. It says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. That's you, beloved. That's you, child of God. Come on, you might not see yourself like that, but that's the way God sees you. All right? He says, I'm, you fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, a skillful wrath in the lowest part of the womb or the earth. Look at verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. In the NLT, that verse says this, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Oh, my God. Which means God has already established a path for every one of us. And it's up to us to find that place. But thank God for the Holy Ghost. Because He is the navigator. He will navigate you. In fact, when, he, when God says you didn't call, you didn't choose Him, He chose you. You got convicted when you heard the gospel. When you received Christ, the Holy Spirit came into you, and now he is your navigator. He will navigate you through life so that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Jesus said he will take what belongs to me and show it to you. He's called the Spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. He will remind you of the things that I've said to you. He will teach you all things. He will be your comforter. He will help you when you're weak. He'll give you strength when you're weak. He will help you navigate through life. It's the reason we need the Holy Spirit. Every day, he says, was laid out. Every moment was laid out before the day even got here. Before any day even got here, God laid it out. He's designed a plan for you and I. It means that you and I existed, existed in God's mind before time began. We were already there. When you get a revelation of this, there's a comfort that goes with it. A comfort in knowing God's got me. I might make some mistakes. And I might make some detours. But the Holy Ghost, the navigator, is able to get me back on track. <laughs> and I'm going to be on the path that he's chosen for me. It might take me a little bit longer to get there. But guess what? I will get there because of the Holy Spirit that guides me and leads me. Hallelujah. Come on, it might take you a little bit longer. Hallelujah. And the reason it takes a little bit longer is because we make decisions on our own at times. And we don't counsel with God. He said, acknowledge Him in all of your ways. And He will direct your path. Sometimes we make decisions and don't even acknowledge because it just seems right to us. It just seems good to us. And everybody else agree, except God. Usually when most people agree, something is wrong. Because his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. He will have a, a, a different idea altogether. And that's why we need to acknowledge him in all of our ways. Said he'll do what? He'll direct your path. 
What path? The path that he has designed for you and I before the foundations of the world. God has designed it, folks. Huh? Hallelujah. Because God is always in the moment. Always. Past, present, and future. Hmm? Your past, your present, and your future is in God's sight right now. Because he exists in eternity and he sees past, present, and future. It's in his sight. One glimpse, one, one glimpse of God, he sees all your life, my life, from beginning to end. I want you to think about that. You can't see that far. But he's God. He sees that far. He's already that far. Hello, he's already there. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Because something he has already ordained. Now, we, you know, we, you, we read in a few scriptures where every one of us have a book. As we read in the scripture, there's a book of works and a book of life. In Revelation, it tells us that everyone is written whose name is written in the book of life. Several passages make reference to the book of life, and your name could be written in it. And then there's, a, there's books called the books of works is where we all going to be judged by. The Bible says, and we all will stand before him, and the books will be open, and God will judge based on your works done here on earth, your works for rewards. And that's usually where the prophets prophesy from. A true prophet prophesied from the book that's written already exists in heaven with your name on it. In other words, God gives them a word from the book. And that's why they can say, thus saith the Lord. Somebody says, is that true? Yes, it is true. Well, let's go back to a scripture that we, we read before. In Hebrews chapter 10, turn there with me. Hebrews and the 10th chapter. Hang on, this will get good. <laughs> it's already good, isn't it? <laughs> Watch this. Look, go to Hebrews, get, the book of Hebrews in, in, uh, in chapter 10. Now, here's, here's this is... Uh, we looked at this before. We'll look at it again. In the 10th chapter, beginning in the 5th verse, it says, Therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. It's speaking of Jesus. He says, You prepared for me a body. So I came in the volume of the book that is written of me. What book? The books that was written by the prophets concerning Christ. Huh? Hello? Are you still here? So there is, there is, some, there is a, a design that God has already laid out for your life and for mine. Amen. He's already established a path for us. Now I want you to think how important that is. Reason being, we don't need to ask anyone. Reason being, we don't need to seek prophets to tell us what's in our future. I said, we don't need to have prophets tell us what's in our future because God already knows what's in your future. And everything is laid out. Every day is laid out, it says. My God. Now, that blows my mind. I don't know what it does for you, but I, I need to find out what's in there. <laughs> I need to find out. I need to take a glimpse of what's in my book. In other words, what's the next step? What's ahead of me? With all that I have to go through in this life right now, something great must be ahead of me. How about you now? How about you? The trouble you face in life, it's all pre-planned. 
the challenges, the obstacles already pre-planned. It's designed to get you where God needs you to be. And that's why the Bible says we have to endure. It says that the, old, the saints of old, in, according to the promise of God, they endured until the end. And they were able to obtain the promises. He said, let us be imitators of them who through faith and patience inherits the promise. Oh, hallelujah. Is that true or not? Well, in case, in case you're wondering, well, where did you get all that from? Well, it's right there. I just read it to you. Jesus said, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, you gave me a body when you were not satisfied with sacrifices of bulls and goats. You gave me a body so I can sacrifice for the sake of humanity. Well, he did the same to you and me. He saw us before the foundations of the world and he gave you a body to live in this earth, to live on this life. I want you to think about how important that is. Think about how important that is. Mm, he was given a body. And so the Bible says when you met Christ that your body became the temple of God. Because the Spirit of God dwells in you. Oh, hallelujah. He said, know ye not that you are the temple and the Spirit of God dwells in you. And then he says, and you're not your own because you've been purchased for a price. He said, therefore you glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thanks be to God. I want you to think about how important that is that my body become God's temple. We say this is the house of God, but this is the temple of God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Everything you were created to do is written in a book with your name on it. Now some of you, if you're in case you're wondering, you go back, look in Scripture, you, you'll find it in Ezekiel, you'll find it in Revelation. Amen. And so everything that God has for you and I, our future, it's a secret. It's a mystery. Don't you think about it. It's, it really is a mystery. It's a mystery. Because you can't find out and you won't know until it's been revealed to you. That's why the Bible says in Deuteronomy 29 and 29, it says the secret things belong to God. And the things which are revealed belongs to you and your children. See, God is always concerned about your children, your heritage. Come on, am I helping you this morment? He said, the secret, it's a secret of God. My future and your future, is go, it's in God, and it's a secret that's hidden in God. I want you to stick with me here for a moment. It's hidden. It's hidden in God. Well, let me, well, just in case you're wondering, let me give you New Testament scripture. Eyes have not seen. Uh, no, ears have not heard. Neither has it entered the heart of men. The things that God has prepared, past tense, for them that love him. Ah, come on, child of God. Come on now. Come on now. Think about it. The things that he, now you got to read it yourself. He hath prepared, past tense. Haven't seen it yet. Didn't hear about it yet. Hadn't entered your heart yet. But it didn't end there. The next verse says, but God had revealed them by his spirit. Oh, shout, shout somebody. Shout somebody. Hallelujah. 
Your eyes have not seen, your ear have not heard, neither has it entered the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them that love Him, but God had revealed it unto them by His Spirit. The Spirit is the navigator. He revealed it. It's a secret. And the secret is hidden in God. Amen. Well, let me give you another New Testament scripture. My life is hidden. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout it again. My life is hidden with Christ. In God. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know? All right, I'll tell you where that is. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Turn there, turn there. Oh, hallelujah. Tell the devil he's a liar. He doesn't know your future. He cannot know your future. Now, we told you this last week. That's why you need to get the, you need to get the recording of it. He don't know your future. Because he's not on my present, only God is. He's not in the future. He knows your past. He, he recognizes your present, but he doesn't know your future. Only God knows your future. Hallelujah. The Colossians in chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1. If you, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. <laughs> Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Seek those what? Those things that are above. Verse 2, set your affections or your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Look at verse 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Is that good enough? For you what? You died. I said, you die. that's not the, this, what I'm looking at, if you're born again, what I'm looking at is not the you you used to be. I'm looking at the new creature that God had created in Christ. He says, because you died and your life is now hidden in Christ or hidden with Christ in God. Well, we just, we just found out that if I'm the temple of God, he says, because you've been purchased with a price and now you don't belong to yourself anymore, we belong to him. And so we serve him and worship him with our bodies and with our spirits, which is God's. We've been bought. In case you don't think that's good news, that is good news, by the way. Because you don't want to live this life on your own. Uh, we need help to succeed. God's way. God's way. Not the way of the world. Because that's nothing but disaster. It, it will end in disaster. You still here? My life is hid with Christ in God. I'm no longer my own. I died, and now I live for him. So now it comes down to the, to the idea or the thought of purpose. For so long, we have heard many teachings on purpose, your purpose, his purpose, her purpose, their purpose. But no, purpose has been misplaced. I said purpose has been misplaced. For so long, I thought the same thing. For so long, I keep thinking about my purpose. And then I found out purpose is not assigned to me. Purpose is assigned to God. 
I know it's a little bit troubling to understand, but let me explain. Because the Bible says, for you know all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and to them that are called according to his purpose. Purpose has been misapplied for a long time. And I was lost in it myself. Because when I start thinking of my purpose, and this one is talking about his purpose, it, has, it leaves a sense of individuality, of self-centeredness, to the point that we start thinking, well, his purpose is greater than her purpose, and her purpose is greater. And you get sort of puffed up, you know, self-centered, self-centered. Well, you know my purpose, so we write books and we do messages, my purpose, you know, my purpose. Well, wait a minute. Wait. Once you died in Christ, it's not your purpose anymore. It's according to his purpose. So purpose have been misplaced in the body of Christ. If you're no longer your own and you've been bought with a price and you belong to him, then whose purpose are we talking about? It takes self out of the picture and it puts Christ in the picture as the main attraction. Now I want you to think, come on church, I'm trying to get you so that you can be ready when, when, the, when the, the, the skies crack open and the cloud and the shout comes with the voice of an archangel that your name will be in that shout because you're not about you, you're about Christ. It's not about us. It's not self-centeredness anymore. It's never been. It has been before you got saved. But now we got saved. Now we no longer belong to ourselves, but we belong to him. So it's all about his purpose for us. How many times have we read that? How many times have we quoted it? Huh? You said, for we know all things, all things, good, bad, ugly, work together for the good to them that are called, to them that love the Lord and are called. Everybody say called. called. You remember, he calls you. I've called you according to his purpose. Purpose is assigned to God, not to us as believers. So we lay down our lives and pick up his. And that's why we have to say, Lord, teach me. Oh, Lord, order my steps in your word, oh, Lord. And let no iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of men that I may keep your precepts. Cause your face to shine upon me and teach me your statutes and your ways because it's all about you. I know it became a cliche. It's all about him. It's all about him. It became a cliche, but the truth is it is about him. Because God, divine election, he said, look, he said, I love, I, before they did anything, good or bad, I chose Jacob. Before they did any works, good or bad, I elected him because I know he will fulfill my will. In advance, God knew it. That's why he chose him. And he says, as far as Esau is concerned, I rejected him. And the Bible calls him profane because he gave up his birthright for a meal. And birthright to God was absolutely important because when you receive your birthright, you're able to pass it on to your children. It becomes inheritance. He said Esau was profane in his actions. And so he said, I rejected him. Divine election. God knows in advance. I said he knows in advance. But you know, I found out that 
there's a way to change the mind of God. Well, that's difficult to hear, isn't it? There's a way to change God's mind concerning you. There was a, there was a king called Hezekiah. And God sent a word through the prophet and says, get your house in order for you're about to die. And God left it. The prophet went to Hezekiah and told him what God said. The Bible says Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and he cried before God and said, God, you know who I am. He says, the, death, the dead cannot praise you. The dead cannot praise you, but I'm alive and I can keep praising you. I can acknowledge you before the people. And he pleaded with God. And before the prophet left that place, God spoke to him, says, turn around and go back and tell that king, Hezekiah, that I'm going to add 15 years to his life. So you and I might be destined to something where we can say, God, I need more time. I, I, I've been crying out. I've been speaking that lately to the Lord. Because in just about two weeks, I'm going to be 67. I'm in the final third of my life. The final third. And so I say, Lord, I'm not done. I, I need some more time. And you said you will satisfy me with long life. And Lord, in about two weeks, three weeks, I'm going to be 67. But Lord, I'm not satisfied. And you said I'll satisfy, you'll satisfy me? I'm not satisfied. So I said, Lord, I need 20, 25 more years. Because I want to finish this work. I want to finish this. I want to end strong. I, I've seen some of my forefathers that have walked all the way through their lives and went home at a good old age, still preaching the gospel. I said, Lord, that's what I want. You know, it's interesting. I'm telling you my private stuff, man. And I made reference to some of the preachers we know, Charles Stanley. Say, Lord, that's what I want. I want to preach all the way up into, into my late 80s. And then I just want to sit down and go home. Not with sickness, not with disease, not with accidents, just to sit down and say, it's time. I'm ready to go. Are you listening? Well, Hezekiah in the Old Testament, he did it. In this New Testament, we have better promises because we got a better priest, the high priest who's making intercession for us. Uh, the Bible says he is our advocate. And this advocate never lost a case. So let me appeal to the advocate and say, would you, oh, come on, child of God, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want, you, I want you to think about that. He said he's our advocate. The Bible says he's our mediator between God and man. That's one that's standing in between. He's an advocate. He never lost a case. So who would you want fighting your case for you? And he's ever in the face of the Father making intercession. So I go to the advocate and says, I need more time. I'm not yet satisfied. I know we're living in a wicked and evil world. Sometimes you feel like you want to leave anyway. But Lord, I want to finish my course. So I asked the Lord, Jesus, take it to the Father. Take it to the Father. And he will plead my case. Oh, hallelujah to God. Because it's about his purpose. So if I die to myself, 
I can fulfill his purpose. Because he said they that hold their life and save their life will lose it. But they that lose their life for my sake shall find it. He said, for my sake, shall find it. So I intend to continue even more now than ever to lose my life for his sake, for the kingdom, so that I'll find it. It's about purpose, not our purpose, but his purpose. Ephesians chapter 1. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm, I'm telling you my secrets. Because <laughs> before we get there, you know, the, uh, that's, the Bible says that uh, the secret things belong to the Lord. I just gave you that. And it says, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And that's the secret. The secret is that mystery. And, you know, when you, when you look at the word, I, I, I did a definition of the word secret. It means something that is kept from knowledge. It means something that is hidden. It also means a mystery. Something that is remote from human notice. Secret. Does that sound familiar? When you say secret, that means, that means my future is in God. It means my future exists in God. And it is accessible because it's hidden in God. And if my life is hidden with Christ in God, it means that my future is accessible. I can access it. Because the Holy Spirit is who reveals it. Did you, did you get that? It's a secret. Well, the Bible says if I dwell in the secret place, I'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The secret place, let me help you here. This is just a sidebar, okay? The secret place is in the presence of God. Listen, the secret place is in God's presence. And the price for God's presence is your time. Because God's presence doesn't come when you're busy doing other things. God's presence comes when you're busy on him. He said, I will even keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. So the secret is the presence of God. The secret, God. the secret is in the presence of God. It's where revelation is revealed. It's where we get revelation from. You see, that quiet time with God is, is where we get understanding and revelation. Now, I have a scripture for that, just in case you're wondering. Now, the scripture for that that I found is in Psalms, uh, did I ask you, we'll go to Ephesians in a moment. Go to Psalms 31. Don't get, don't get upset with me. We're a Bible church. Amen. I'm not going to tell you something that came, that's out of me. I'm, I want to tell you what came from God Amen. and do my best to, to share that with you. Like in Psalms and 31, for example. We'll do that quickly. Psalms 31. Hallelujah. Are you learning? Yes. All right. Oh, just wait for me, wait for me. Psalms 31. And here we look at um, verse, verse 19. Psalms 31 and verse 19. It says, Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you or reverence you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you. Watch this. In the presence of the sons of men. He said, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. From the plot of men, you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Do you see that? You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. The secret place is in his presence. 
And that's where the Holy Spirit can reveal to us things to come, even concerning our lives. And we don't necessarily need a prophet to tell us that. Right? So how do you get to the secret place? The price for his presence is in that secret place. So you, you and I will never find time to be with God. We have to make time to be with God. <clears throat> because our lives are so busy. And you know what I'm talking about. We've got so much to do every day. And these are legitimate responsibilities. But for some reason, we have to shut down a few of them and give God the time so we can understand where we're going and where God wants to take us because we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. And it doesn't happen if you're busy, if we're busy all the time. So if it's hidden in God, hidden with Christ in God, that's the secret place. But it, it is accessible. You can access it. Oh, access it, excuse me. So my future is a secret that's hidden in God. So is yours. See, don't wait till you come to the church to be taught and preached to to get answers. Because when you do that, what if something happens you can't come? Well, we just experienced that a few couple of years ago. Huh? Got to be in his presence to get answers. The answers is in God's presence. You can create that in your home. You can create that in your own seat, in your own closet. But there's something a whole lot greater when it comes to the corporate anointing, where the gathering of the body of Christ get together physically. I promise you before God this morning, it is so important to God. It is, it is ultimately important to God. It's where all the parts of the body comes together. See, you can have all the parts, but it doesn't mean much until it's come together. If you have all the parts to your car, well, you got all the parts. But it's not, <laughs> it doesn't do any good unless it's assembled. That's why the Bible calls this the assembly. You can't get it by yourself, you have to assemble. And there are times that people don't have to say anything to you, just the fact that you assemble. You see, one part feeds the other. You don't have, you, sometimes you don't have to say anything. Just a couple of words at times. Just being in the presence, just being in the assembly. Like my body, my body's assembled. That's where you get the benefits from. That's why, that's what the devil tried to keep the church divided, and keep the church apart. So we can sit in our homes and turn the television on and get, no, it's not the same. You can never, ever grow that way. You can be sustained, but you can't grow. You only grow when the parts is assembled. I hope you're getting this. All right. I, if you consider your physical body, it has to be assembled to grow. That's why God relayed the church as the body of Christ. Not just an entity, it's the body of Christ. And his, his, his body needs to assemble to grow. And so you can shout me down if you want to, but the truth is you cannot grow spiritually without assembly. I, I'll say it again, you cannot grow spiritually without assembling. You notice the amens are getting more and more faint. So you say that just to get us in church. Yes. Because our, our job is to help you grow. That's the whole idea, to grow up spiritually. 
Don't let the, the devil lie to you and tell you it's okay. I can get all I need just watching, watching the church on TV. I can sit in my living room and watch church on TV. I can get all I need. No, sir, you don't grow that way. You cannot. You can only be sustained. Can't grow. So that's why we make every effort. I, listen, I'm here, and I can't wait to get here during service time. I'm talking Sundays and Wednesdays. After all these years, I look forward. And this is the, God's truth. Don't, don't misunderstand me. There's times that my body says, oh, man, don't. You. There's times, you know, your whole being, forget it. I, I just want to stay in bed. I don't feel like going. I've done enough work for the day. And you don't, I really don't. Come on now, it's the truth. But when I look on the inside, when I start digging, I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a trap. That's a trick. I can give my time to everything else, but I can't give God two hours on a Sunday morning. That's a trap. It's easy for me to go to that job, but it's so hard for me to come to the house of God. What do you think that is? That's not you, that's the devil attacking you physically and telling you that you don't have to. You just need to rest. Take it easy. You say what you want. That's the truth. That is the absolute truth. Can't grow. You can't grow if you're not assembled. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Ephesians. I'm getting done. Okay, I'm getting done here. Ephesians. Hallelujah. Chapter 1. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Jesus. Chapter 1. Hallelujah. All right, for the sake of time, we won't read all of it. I have several verses that I wanted to read, but let's just read verse 11. Uh, now, I'll tell you what, let's go back to verse, verse 9. It says, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Remember, that's the hidden, that's the secret, it's in the secret place. The mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in all or one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. According to the purpose of who? Of him. We obtain an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him. This Predestined means to do in advance, to call in advance. Hello. That's what it means, to call in advance. Predestined. All right, we go to the last passage, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Hallelujah. And uh, we look in verse, verse 8. And verse 9. Verse 8 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, it's Paul saying this, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own what? According to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ when? Before time began. Which means we were in God's mind before you were even shaped and formed in your mother's womb. And we have, we have been given a body for his purpose to glorify him. 
And so that's why he says, now your body is my temple. Now that you're dead, I bring you alive. So we're alive in Christ. I said alive in Christ. Glory, glory be to God. Revealed to us by his spirit. You have the spirit of God in you? And your body and your spirit belongs to God, and he will guide you through your spirit. Not through philosophy, not through the church, not through pastor, not through me, not through anyone, but through the spirit that dwells in you. He will guide you into all truth. And that's what a navigator is, one that guides you. And I call the Holy Spirit our navigator. He'll guide you through this troubled world. It's hard sometimes, isn't it? Because you look around and see all the stuff that's going on and you just feel like you're just spinning your wheels, just wasting time. But thank God, he, doesn't, he does not exist in time. He exists in eternity. And he doesn't count time like we do. We count time in months, years, weeks, days, hours, minutes. And God counts time in seasons. That's why the Bible says when the fullness of time comes. Fullness of time is a season in God's eyes. He said that's why he said a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as a day unto the Lord. And the church said amen. amen. Stand up with me on your feet. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a good praise for his word. Give the Lord a good praise for his word.